We're going to focus on Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. And there's an outline in the bulletin that will help you follow along. And the title of the sermon is Christ's Glory Over Guatemala. And it's the purpose of this sermon is to give us the biblical motive for service for him, for living for him, and for spreading the gospel to all different lands. So it's particularly to focus in on the motive, the motive of the work. Pastor Marcus um, told us about the, what the work is, and now this is where the, the, our motive is found here. So let me start by saying, uh, right now in our society, in our country, there is a, a question that is commonly asked about motive. And it's the, the motive of ISIS. The motive of ISIS. Uh, consider how um, these different headlines. From the Atlantic, what is the title of the article? What ISIS really wants. From CNN video, title, what motivates ISIS? From the uh, periodical, the Quora, what is the ideology motivating the Islamic State? Now from World News, The Guardian. Why ISIS fights? Now from the PBS NewsHour. What motivated the terror attacks in Paris? Or from uh, Harvard, and they, they write, um, so who are the members of ISIS, what do they want, and how have they taken center stage so quickly? When you think about now today, in our secular West, there is this big question that everyone's asking. What motivates ISIS to do this war that they're doing? What is their motivation? It's very difficult for us here in the U.S. to understand their thinking. Now, think about they're doing a war for evil, and Christ in the Bible calls us to a war for truth, to war for good, to war for love, to war for the gospel, that we're in a truth war. What is to be the motive for us? What is to be our mind as we go about these things? Next week, God willing, we'll answer the question about ISIS, but this week, let's answer what motivates us. What should motivate us? And that is found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. In verse 5 reads, Let this mind be in you, which was, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Here we see the, the, the apostle is calling us to a command. The, this, let this mind, is an imperative. It's a, um, a clear command in the form that is given in Greek. The apostle is saying to the church in Philippi, this is how you've got to think. This is what has got to motivate you and keep you living on. The mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you. So why is he beginning to do that? Let's, let's look at the context very briefly. In, in verses 1 to 4, he has been exhorting the church about unity. He says in verse 1, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, of any fellowship of the Spirit, if any af affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. So here the Apostle Paul is correcting them. He's correcting the church and saying, um, you need to be doing this. Have this one mind. In verse 3 then, what does he say not to do? If we're to have what to, to do in verses 1 and 2, be of one mind, what are we not to do in verse 3? Let nothing be done with self through selfish ambition or conceit. Okay, so if we're not to be selfish, then how are we to practice that? He'll tell us how. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for your, out for your own interest, but also for the interests of others. Okay, so he's told the church, this is what you're to do, be of one mind. This is what you're not to do, to be selfish, conceited. And this is, now he tells them how to practice it. 
You're to practice it by, when you see somebody else, you, you think, they're better than I am. When you think about what to do, you think about, how are, what are the interests of others? How can I help others? Not just my own interests. Okay, so if the apostle in verses 1 to 4, he instructs and says, this is what you're to do, this is what you're not to do, and this is how you're to practice it, then, then the question you ask is, why am I to do it? Why am I to do it? Why am I to have this, this unity? Why am I to do it? Because of what um, the mind of Christ is to be in this. What God has done, who Jesus is in his person and work, is to be the motive. In verse 5, then, he, he commands, let this mind be in you. Let this mind be in you. And he's saying that you need to think this way. You need to have this mindset. This thinking needs to be affecting your will, your affections, your conscience. You are to think the way Christ thinks. Not, you're not to act in slavish obedience, but you're to be filled with a mind, with an attitude that changes your life from the inside out. It is to be the steering wheel that drives your car. What is the motive? What is the steering that drives what you do? It is the mind of Christ. So what he's saying, and he's, what he's, com he's commanding, God is commanding that this text, particularly verses 6 to 11, those verses need to be ingrained in you so much so that it changes who you are. It changes who you are from the inside out. And it gives you the motives for what you do in a daily basis. Okay? Verses 6 to 11 are to become a part of you. By the Spirit of God, these verses are going to be explained and thrown out to you. And you need to take them. You need to ingest them. They need to become a part of you. So that this, these verses are always in your memory. They're always in your thinking. And they motivate you and you live off of them. Do you see this command? It's a very important command and it, it, it should change who you are. You should not walk out of here at the same person because of verses 6 to 11. So here's the command. Then what is it, verses 6 to 11, what is the content that should be in our mind? It is a song. It is a song, and you can know that by the stylistic and the li linguistic elements in verses 6 to 11. It is a song about Christ. It's a song you're to sing about Christ. It is a creed. It is a confession. It is doxology. It is worship. It is worship. It is called the Carmen Christi. It is the song of the glory of Christ. It is a song the New Testament church used. And this song is to be a part of how you think. So let's see in verse 6. Let's go through this song and see the content here. In verses 5 to 6 of this song, we'll see that it's about, God's pre, um, about Christ's pre-incarnate glory. In verses 7 to 8, We'll see about its Christ's glory, incarnation glory, how it becomes a man. And then verses 9 to 11, we see it's about Christ's exalted glory. So it's about Christ's glory. Christ's glory is to be your motive. Christ's glory before he came, Christ's glory in coming to save the world, and Christ's exalted glory that he ha now has. So first, verses 5 to 6, Christ's pre-incarnate glory. Look with me in verse 6. Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Here we have now an explanation of Jesus Christ. He's the who. Jesus Christ is the who. And this verse describes Jesus Christ, who he is, his person, and his work, what he's done. This verse is similar to John 1.1. 1, 1. When John 1.1 1, 1 describes how in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. In the beginning, Jesus is God. He has always been God, he is, and He always will be God. And He was with God. 
Do you see the doctrine of the Trinity is there in John 1.1? 1, 1. How Jesus is God and he is with God. That can only take place in the Trinity. And here now in verse 6, Jesus Christ's person and work, his person who being in the form of God. This is morphe in the Greek. It is describing here the, how Jesus Christ is in very nature, in character, in kind and manner. He is God. He does not show up in metamorphosizing himself to show up in different forms like a, like a butterfly that shows up as a caterpillar and then it shows up as, um, as a butterfly fully grown. God doesn't change forms like that from changing from being God to being a man to back to God to being an angel or um, changing from in forms from the Father to the Son to the Spirit. No, three separate persons who Jesus Christ being God, he doesn't consider it robbery to be equal with God. You see, there's another person in the mix who Jesus Christ being the, in the form of God. He is in his own nature. He is God. And Jesus Christ is with God. He considers it not robbery to be equal with God. This description of Jesus Christ being God is similar to 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, where it says Christ is the very image of God. It is the same idea as Colossians 1.15 where it describes that he is the image of God. This description of saying that Jesus Christ, being in the form of God, is describing him as have natively being God, essentially being God, and essential to his quality and his person is his glory. The shining forth, forth of his attributes. This form and description of God, it can't be anything less than God. You can't be anything less than God. Because it describes him, he says, in, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He doesn't consider it something to be grasped, something to be held on to. Uh, this being form of God. Or being, receiving the glory that he receives, that he deserves. So consider with me, Jesus Christ is being put forth as an example of humility. Okay? He's the ultimate example of humility. Who being God, he doesn't hold on to the praise and the worship that he deserves in heaven. This description of being in the form of God must mean God and nothing else because he's given his example of humility. That he deserves to be worshipped as God, but he doesn't hold on to it. If Jesus Christ was an angel, and that this somehow meant that he was an angel and not God, and he's supposed to be held up as an example of humility, but he didn't hold on to equality with God. You see how that doesn't make sense? It's kind of like I walk in and I say, don't worry, Robert, you don't have to treat me like I'm the president of the United States. I'm not the president. I know I'm not supposed to be treated as the president. It's not, I'm not being humble. I'm being prideful. You see? If the president walks in and he says, you don't have to treat me as the president, you can, we are friends. Can it call me by my first name. You see, that's an expression of humility. So this, by the context and by the description of the words, being in the form of God must mean Jesus is God. So Jesus being God, he is the one, um, the way John Murray, is a, uh, John Murray said about this text, the apostle could not have used a more complete expression to communicate that Jesus is Godhead. He could not have been any clearer to express that Jesus is God. So G this text says, this verse says, Jesus, being in the form of God, he doesn't consider it something to be held on to, something to be grasped, something to be held tight. Some of the dictionaries say, about him, that he has always had the nature of God. 
and did not consider that remaining, remaining equal with God was something to be held onto forcibly. The exegetical dictionary in the New Testament says Christ did not regard his position of equality with God as something to take advantage of for himself. Him being in a state of equality with the Father, that state, it belongs to Christ. He has a right to it. Do you remember how there's someone who wanted that state and it wasn't his? Satan. Satan. Jesus has that state and he doesn't hold on to it. He doesn't hold on to the glory he deserves. Do you see his humility? That he deserves all glory, honor, and praise. Think of Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 we know is the description of Jesus Christ. In John, he, the it refers to Isaiah chapter 6. We'll get that to that text. And it refers to, in Isaiah 6, is Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 6, the, Isaiah has a vision of Jesus Christ high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filling the temple. And the angels saying, holy, holy, holy. The worship of heaven is centered around Jesus Christ. This glorious one, this glorious one sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, where the angels cover their, their faces, where the angels cover their feet, where the angels continually cry out, holy, holy, holy. He humbles himself. The one who makes the heavens... The one who stretched out the Milky Way and any other galaxy. The one who makes every leaf. The one who designs the aerodynamic features of a bird's wings. The one who makes the waterfall. The one who makes a rainy day and, and a sunny one. The God of all creation. The designer of every animal. The designer of you. The maker of heaven and earth. Is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ with all power. Reigning in glory in heaven. Jesus Christ having power. Gravity. He's the maker of that power. Electricity. He is the maker of that energy. All forces of heat are, of, um, are nothing compared to his power. He is the maker of them all. There is no political power like his. There is no earthly power like his. There is no angelic power as the power that he has. Him, him being God. Means he is creator. Him being God, he has all power. Him being God, he has all knowledge. Him being God, he is Lord over time. He deserves worship and he was receiving worship. But he humbles himself to act. Act in such a way where he doesn't receive the worship that he deserves. He acts for his own glory. He acts in love. And he acts in joy. His example of acting is to be part of our mind. His example where he deserves all praise is to change the way we think. Where he is deserving praise and honor and glory. We don't deserve it. We deserve the wrath of God for our sin. It, this Seeing him act like this should change the way we think. Here now in verse 6a, we see Jesus Christ is God. And now in 6b, we see he doesn't, Christ does not hold unto the glory he deserves. There's Christ's pre-incarnate glory. Now in verses 7 to 8, see his glory in the incarnation. Christ's glory in the incarnation. 
Verse 7, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. This verse starts out with a contrast. Though he was um, in heaven, receiving all glory, and he was equal with the Father, and he's in the form of God, contrast, great contrast, he makes himself of no reputation. He makes it as though he's a nobody. He empties himself, not of his person, not of his attributes, not of his godhood, but he empties himself of the glory that he should receive. He doesn't remove elements of his rank or status, but instead he removes privileges that he deserves. He, re he empties himself of proper recognition. He empties himself of praise. He empties himself to the form of a servant, to the form of a slave. Do you see that? That word form there, taking the form of a bondservant, the form is morphe again. The same word that's described him being essentially in his character God, he becomes essentially in his character, in his person, he becomes a slave. A slave. That's what bondservant is. He didn't exchange the form of a God for the form of a man. No, he manifested the form of God in the form of a slave, in the form of a man. He became the God-man. Fully God. Fully man. This is a, uh, is a text that describes in his character. It describes his love. That he gives up what he deserves and takes on the lowest form, the form of one of us. Notice how he takes the initiative. He made himself of no reputation. Love is known by the cost of what it costs you. And here is a cost we can't comprehend. Here's a cost that's greater than our understanding. Love is known by when you take the initiative. When, you're, when someone who wants to be loving, they act. They're not forced upon it, but they decide it to do it. And here, look at that, that love in verse 7. He makes himself of no reputation. It's something he does. He gives up his status. He gives, gives up his privileges. John MacArthur is helpful to us in this, where he describes on this point how, one, he gives up heavenly glory. Two, he gives up independent authority. Three, he gives up personal prerogative. Four, he gives up eternal riches. Five, he gives up intimate fellowship with the Father. So he gives up eternal, heavenly glory. He gives up independent authority. He gives up divine prerogative. He gives up, gives up his eternal, eternal riches. He gives up fellowship with the Father. And he becomes a bondservant. And who would have dreamed or ever foreseen that we could hold God in our hands? The giver of life is born in the night, revealing God's glorious plan to save the world. The one who makes the heavens humbles himself to be under the heavens. The one who makes all of the galaxies, humbles himself to one galaxy, humbles himself to one solar system within a galaxy, humbles himself to one planet in one solar system. He humbles himself to one continent in one dirty little planet. He humbles himself to one country in one little continent in one little universe, the maker of it all. He humbles himself to, to learn the Hebrew alphabet. He humbles himself, the maker of 
the aerodynamic features of a bird's wings, he humbles himself to the point of a child to wonder how birds fly. He humbles himself to become a carpenter in a little back country in the other side of the world. The maker of heaven and earth has come down the greatest distance. You know, I've seen before, um, there have been times where I've opened up like food to feed animals, and then there have been so many roaches in there. Um, they just scatter out, right? And I kicked the, I've kicked the bag before because I know there's a cup in there to get food for the animals. And I kick the bag because I don't want them to crawl up my arm while I reach in there. And what I'm expressing is I don't want anything to do with a handful of roaches or a ha roaches crawling up my hand. But here's, here's the point. For me to condescend to the level of a roach, I'm much closer there. That gap is much closer than from here to heaven. The roach is a creation. I'm a creation. Christ is the creator. He is other. He is of a different kind. It, it does not uh, compare. For him to humble himself, being in the form of God, to take on the form of a slave coming in the likeness of men. This verse in, in verse 7 at the end part is describing it again in his essential nature. It is who he is. And he remains to be. In 2 Corinthians 8, 9, it describes how though he was rich, he became poor in the gospel. In Romans 8, 3, it describes how he came in flesh, in the likeness of men. Look at how he humbles himself. He makes himself of no reputation. How he empties himself. He empties himself not by removing anything essential to him, but he humbles himself by taking something. Isn't that a strange thing? We humble ourselves by taking something away. By taking something away from us. If I became blind, it would humble me. I would lose something and it would become, I would be humbled. Well, God cannot take anything from himself. He can't cease to be God. So how does God humble himself? He humbles himself not by subtraction, but by addition. He takes on the form that you have. He takes on the form that you have. He humbles himself not by subtraction, but by addition. He humbles himself by taking. That's what the verse says. That's what it describes. Many people from many different years have said many heretical things about Christ based in verse 7, saying, oh, he empties himself. He's not God. He empties himself. He's no longer God. He empties himself. He, he um, ceased to be God or he ceased to be. No, the verse says he humbles himself not by removing, but by adding, by taking. He humbles himself. And in ver verse 8, describes how he becomes in appearance as a man. Now it describes this word, the appearance, is particularly for his, the way he looked. If you came up to Jesus Christ, and there was a crowd, and you were to pick Jesus Christ out of the lineup, you couldn't do it. He's not the guy with the mullet and the um, robe and the, you know, the blue sash and the, the nice beard. You wouldn't be able to pick him out and say, oh, from, I remember from flannel graph in Sunday school. Yep, that's what Jesus looks like. You're not going to, he's going to look just, he looked just like any other person. He had to do the same things other kids do. Um, I remember hearing a song about the miracle of the incarnation. What an amazing thing that God would become a man. And as a little boy, he would see little girls whisper and laugh and wonder, what are they whispering about? that he would humble himself by taking on the need to grow in, um, as a genuine human being. He looked, his bodily form was just like any other person. His attributes and characteristics were of a real human. 
he, he, he doesn't, his humanity dies on the cross. He doesn't die, God can't die. The point here is his servanthood comes down to where we're at. He humbles himself. God humbles himself to listen to our prayers, but much more than that, he humbles himself to become one of us. Here now, it describes this humility comes even to the point of obedience, even to the point of death on the cross. And who would have dreamed or ever foreseen that we could hold God in our hands? The giver of life is born in the night, (laughs) revealing God's glorious plan to save the world. Here, it is... Jesus Christ's person and work, again in verse 7 and 8. What's his person? His person is that he is the the God-man. He's not just God. He is fully God, fully man. What is his work now here in his incarnation? His work is him humbling himself to the point of obedience. And not just any obedience. And obedience to the point of death on the cross. This is something unique. This is something rare. This is a a mountain peak of truth. This is an ocean of the reality of the love of God and the goodness of God. This truth here should be a regular part of you that that should change who you are and should change the way you think. He humbles himself and becomes obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Consider the context. The Apostle Paul is describing to this church, this church at Philippi, that you need to be humble. You need to be unified. And how you need to, look at verse 12. You need to Obey. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation, your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's saying, the Apostle Paul is saying to this people, you need to be humble. You need to be unified. You need to be obedient with fear and trembling. Look at what he says in verse 14. You need to do all things without complaining. And disputing. Verse 15, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. List out, not right now, write out the things that you're told to do in this text. In those verses, you are told to be unified, you're told to be humble. You are told to be obedient. You are told to be without complaining. And you're told to be a light in the world, holding forth the word of light. If you write out all those commandments, now you think about the song of Christ. It will tell you something about yourself, tell you something about God, it will tell you something about how you need the gospel. We struggle. In, in to be unified. We argue with our family, friends, co-workers. Why? Because we're prideful. Christ is the ultimate picture of humility. Him deserving all praise, he makes a decision to act and humble himself. We are told to be unified. He is the one who brings ultimate unity and truth. We are told that we need to obey, but we don't like we should. He is obedient, not just obedient to the Father, he's obedient to the point of death. Not just any death, but he's obedient to the point of death on the cross. You understand, the cross in itself, to the Philippian ear, would be a curse word. An actual curse word. 
In Philippi, they are Roman citizens. They have achieved a status that is unique in the, in the ancient world. They are a Greek city, Macedonian city in the area, and they have been allowed to have the status of to be a Roman citizen. A Roman citizen was not allowed to be crucified. For them, you don't mention the cross in polite society. It is a word that brings to mind all forms of suffering, evil, shame, horrendous things. It's something that you turn your, um, your child's um, eyes away from. It's you cover their ears. You don't want them to think about what happens on a cross. It is, to, for the Apostle Paul to mention it is like mentioning a word that's like a curse word. It would burn the ears. If I say rape and were to describe that, that you, you would want to turn your eyes away, you would want to turn, close, put your hands over your ears, and you say, you don't talk about that in polite society. It's the same with the cross. The cross was not something that was um, an emblem for churches for many years. Many years following um, the apostolic time. Because of the shame. And what I'm saying is, we complain, we complain because, and we don't, we're not obedient like we should be. But he becomes obedient even to the point of the cross. And the cross to face not just any death, but to face the undiluted fury of God. Sometimes Muslims will make fun of um, Jesus Christ in his, how he's in the, the garden, sweating great drops of blood, and they would say, um, they, describe, they don't believe he die, actually died on the cross, but that somehow he escaped from that. And they, say, and they talk about how he's fearful of it, but they don't understand what happened at the cross. He's not fearful of just nails. He's not fearful of just thorns, of a crown of thorns. He is... I'm trembling at facing the undiluted fury of God that should have been poured out on us. He's obedient even to this point. But what are we in contrast? We think we deserve praise, but we deserve the wrath of God. He does deserve praise, and he, he puts that aside. We think we deserve things that we haven't received. And he is the one who takes on things that he doesn't deserve. This is the beauty of the good news. This is the beauty of what Christ has done. He's humbled himself. And this must change you. This must motivate you. This must make it so that you do whatever it takes to hold out the word of life. To hold forth the word of life. To shine in a perverse generation. As our generation becomes more and more perverse. Then we can shine all the more for Christ. When we are obedient and we don't complain. And we're humble and unified. We reflect back. Why? 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 Why would we do any of those things? Why would we do any good? Why would we plant churches in other places? Why would we act? Why would we reach all those we can reach for Christ and then send some for the unreached? Why? Because of the love of Christ humbling himself and becoming a man and obedience to the point of the cross itself. What we do in obedience, we can only say, It's the least we can do. It is the least we can do. If you suffer and die as a martyr, oh, we do not sing your, your, the, the praise of your name. It's the least that you can do. If you pour out your life in humility, where you never receive the things you, the things you long for, or the things you think you deserve, then I say to you, it was just the least you can do for Christ. If you can love and be faithful in the church, I do not applaud you. I say that's the least that you can do. 
you compare the love of Christ and the gospel, you take that and you put that in your mind and you make it stay there. You hold it tight and say, that's the good news for me. That's what I believe for me. He has done that, that love for me. And who would have dreamed or ever foreseen that we could hold God in our hands? The giver of life is born in the night, revealing God's glorious plan to save the world. It's the least that we can do to draw people to Him. The Father... In, now in Philippians 2, verses 9 to 11, the Father has something to say about what Jesus Christ has done. And we'll close there. The Father says, therefore, he's the one who acts, therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those in, on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here, the Father is the one who now begins to act. In verses 5 to 8, we see about Jesus Christ and Him acting. Now the Father acts in response. And so what does He, he do? He highly exalts him and gives him a name. And that name is Lord. That name is Lord. First, he highly exalts him. 28 times Paul uses compound words. This is the only time he uses this particular word. And it means to highly elevate, to raise aloft, to be raised to the highest position. Jesus Christ is taken to the pinnacle of the universe and pointed as Lord of all because of His messianic work. His Lordship reigns over all. The Father takes Him to the highest position and says, He's the one who deserves all submission. He's the one who all the world will bow to. Either you bow now or you bow later. Either you bow now in worship and thanks and praise, or you bow later as you burn. You will bow one way or another. That's what the Father says about how He responds to the work that Christ has done. He gives Him a true exaltation. This is the, the highest form of the principle of the, if you humble yourself, you will be exalted in due time. This is the clearest form of that principle. Continually taught in the scripture. Humble yourself before God. And he's the one who will raise you up. That's taught in James 4.10. It's taught in 1 Peter 5.6. And it was taught of Christ in Luke 1.52. Every king that has ever come will bow before this king of kings. Every dictator will have to admit he's the one who has all authority. Every conqueror will watch him rule and conquer the world and will have to submit. Every genius will have to admit he is the one with all knowledge. Everyone with the greatest strength will have to admit he is the one who has all power and strength. Every demon and every angel will admit he is Lord of all. This description um, is calling to mind Isaiah 45, verses 20 to 25. For time's sake, I've not been going to a lot of texts, but we've got to go to this one. Let's go to this one. Isaiah 45, Isaiah 45, verses 20 to 25. Because this is what Paul has in mind in this song. Isaiah 45, verse 20. Assemble yourselves together and come. Draw near together, 
you have, who have escaped from the nations. They have no knowledge who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save. So gather, gather, gather everybody. Gather away from idolatry. Tell, in verse 21, tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord that there is no other God besides me? A just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Here, Yahweh, God, the one who is self-existent, the God of the Old Testament, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, in verse 21, have I not I the Lord? There is no other God beside me. Verse 22, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That what? That what? That to me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall take an oath, shall confess, shall admit. He shall say, surely in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come and all shall be ashamed or incensed against me. You see how everyone's going to come. Everyone's going to come to God. And whether you are incensed, whether you're against Him, and you're going to bow. Or whether you're in worship to Him, you'll bow. And who does it talk about? In the Lord, all the descendants of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. Who is this Lord? We turn to Philippians 2. And this Lord is none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. And He is taken to this position... It is not a change in his essential quality, but instead is in Acts 2.36. Peter says, Let all the house of Israel know, assuredly, that God has made him both Lord and Christ. That Jesus Christ that you've been crucified. It is his lordship, and I'm quoting a, a um, Baptist preacher. It, was, it is his lordship and messiahship. His messianic lordship that was bestowed upon him in his exaltation. Not that he wasn't Messiah and Lord before the resurrection, he was. But that he had not fulfilled the mission of Messiah until he had died for our sin and risen again. And, and therefore, before his death and resurrection, the lordship of Christ over the world had not been brought to full actuality. Rebel forces had not yet, were not yet defeated. And the power of darkness held grip. In order to be um, acclaimed Messiah and Lord, the Son of God had to come, defeat the enemy, and lead his people out of bondage and triumph over sin, Satan, and death. Because of his work, Christ puts him and exalts him and gives him the glory he deserves. If Christ has done this, since Christ has done this, our service and love and spreading of his name is the least we can do. It is the least we can do. And who would have dreamed or ever foreseen that we could go hold God in our hands? The giver of life is born in the night, revealing God's glorious plan to save the world. Christ has come. He has come from the greatest heights of heaven. His pre-incarnate glory. He turns away the glory he deserves. He humbles himself to become a man, to become obedient to death on the cross. The greatest humility imaginable that can be conceived. And now he is exalted as Lord. And everyone, every knee that you have ever seen, that knee that you can touch now, that knee that you can touch now will one day bow before the King of Kings. That message needs to be taken to every tribe, every tongue, every nation. That Jesus Christ is Lord. His love of His glory, His glory should motivate you. It should be in your mind at all times. That's why. We spread his name and his fame. It's the least we can do. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we pray.
that this wouldn't be an, an empty time where uh, we just come and we read verses and we walk out the same people. Lord, we know that we need your mercy and grace so that this, these verses become ingrained in our thinking so that when we are insulted, we would think about you and how you were insulted and you, how you humbled yourself. So we wouldn't react in anger, but instead humility. We, uh, we need this thinking to be ingrained in us so that we think about obedience like you thought about obedience. We need to be ingrained in our thinking so we hold forth the word of life like you held forth the word of life. Lord, help us to be motivated by this. Help us to meditate on this and to understand this so that it becomes a part of who we are so that this, we have your mind, Christ. Help us to have your mind. Lord, we need you. Amen.